Father, we thank you and praise you, Lord God, for all that you are, all that you have called us to be. And Father God, all that is happening among us, through us, with us, and for us, Lord God. We thank you and praise you, Father, for this house. We bless Pastor Patricia and all the leadership team. And Lord God, we thank you and praise you that as the, the, the house, this, this house, Lord God, is just filling up. It's, it's filling up. It's filling up with your people more and more each week, and therefore your spirit is very high. And we are in expectation of what you are bringing to us, Lord God, for your kingdom. So we thank you and praise you, Lord God, in the name of your precious son, Jesus. And everyone said, amen, 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 amen. The topic tonight is breaking generational sins and curses. So uh, every living person is part of a family, whether we are close to our families or not, whether we even know our families or not. It doesn't change the fact that if you are alive, you came from somewhere. <laughs> you had parents, a father and a mother. You had grandparents, aunts, uncles, cousins, and siblings. So, like it or not, being a part of a family unit comes with many blessings. It comes with things like unconditional love, and support. It comes with structure and empathy and compassion. However, for someone who, someone else being part of a family can bring unwanted things into your life. I'll read that sentence again. However, for someone else bring, being a part of a family can bring unwanted things in your life. Certain families come with baggage. Other families come with a lack of structure or a lack of love. Sometimes being a part of a family comes with curses. Being genetically tied to a family means that there are certain genetic dispositions that will be written in your DNA. Health histories. Well, you know when you go to the doctor, they all, every time, want to take your health history. They want to see who you're connected with and what kind of issues they have in their bodies. So health issues like a heart disease or diabetes, high blood pressure, alcoholism, drug addiction, and mental health disorders have all been proven to be genetically transferable from one generation to the next. So the question is, what are generational sins and curses? Well, what does the Bible say about them? The Bible talks about iniquity and sin. And iniquity and sin are often used interchangeably. What are these things? Iniquity means perversity, depravity, Guilt or punishment of iniquity. It's someone who lacks moral or spiritual principles. Iniquity is a consequence of or punishment. There is a consequence or punishment for iniquity. So in, in uh, Exodus 20, verse 5, and this is the New Living Translation. You must not bow, God is talking to the Israelites when they came out of Egypt. You must not bow down to idols or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God who will not tolerate, and that's a strong word, will not tolerate your affection for any other gods. I lay the sins of the parents upon their children. The entire family is affected even children in the third and fourth generations of those who reject me. But I lavish unfailing love for a thousand generations on those who love me and obey my commands. So when we are, are in session sometimes and we're going through removing the generation sins and curses, we 
go to this part once the person receives the blessings, that these blessings flow to a thousand generations. Amen? Amen. So uh, in the voice, this same verse reads, You are not to bow down and serve any image, for I, the eternal God, am a jealous God. As for those who are not loyal to me, their children will endure the consequences of their sin for three or four generations. But those who love me and keep my directives, their children will experience my loyal love for a thousand generations. Now, we all want to move and walk with that blessing. Amen? That, that our children will receive the blessings that we receive to a thousand generations. Okay. Exodus 20, verse 5 and 6 in the message reads, No carved gods of any size, shape, or form of anything, whatever, whether of things that fly or walk or swim, don't bow down to them and don't serve them because I am God, the Lord says. I am God, your God, and I'm a most jealous God, punishing the children for any sins their parents pass on to them to the third and, yes, even fourth generation of those who hate me. But I'm unswervingly loyal to the thousands who love me and keep my commandments. That's we want to experience that. Amen? Amen. In um, Exodus 34, 7, in the voice it reads, He who maintains loyal love to thousands of people who forgives wrongdoing, rebellion, and sin, yet does not allow sin to go unpunished, extending the consequences of a father's sin to his children and his grandchildren and even to the third and fourth generations. So are we seeing how serious it is that the Lord has brought us out of darkness into his marvelous light that we would be able to see what the blessings are that he has for us and for our children and our children's children. God is not a man, and he does not lie. He does not lie. So when we read something in his word, we can take it to the bank. It's truth, whether it's the blessing for us or whether it's something else that we need to pay attention to. In Nehemiah, this is how the people handled these, um, these uh, curses that were happening in their lives. It says in the Amplified, and the Israelites, they had, they had become involved with a lot of different people groups. They had married outside of the Hebrew culture. And it says, and the Israelites separated themselves from all the foreigners and stood and confessed their sins and the iniquities of their fathers. And what we have in, in this new uh, dispensation from the new uh, covenant in Galatians 3.13 it tells us in the voice the anointed one the liberating king has redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us it was stated in the scriptures everyone who hangs on a tree is cursed by God and so Jesus took on what was due us. And so when we accept him as our Lord and Savior, then we become redeemed from the curse of the law and made he being made a curse for us because he hung on that tree. He hung on the tree for us. We don't have to hang on the tree. He did it for us. And when we or worship him and adore him and come before him on behalf of our families. He hears us and he touches the hearts of our families, causing them to have their eyes open to see 
that Jesus Christ is Lord. There's not coming another king, another savior. He, Jesus is the savior of the world. Amen? Amen. So let's, let's look at a um, little bit of definitions here. For sin, for, um, trans, for it, sin, iniquity, and, and uh, trespasses. Sin means missing the mark, violating God's law. So when, when the word says, honor your father and your mother, do not steal, do not commit adultery, those things are called the Ten Commandments. They are part of the law. When they are transgressed, when they are um, transgressed, when someone commits those things, it's called sin. Sin is what happens when we violate God's law. Transgression is the actual act of violating God's law. And iniquity is the, it's, it says from what I read, and, and it's, I believe it's a, a right description. Iniquity is the dirtiness that lives in one when they've engaged in the sin by transgressing God's law. So it's almost like you see something deposited in the person when they transgress the law. Something is deposited in them that's not of God. So in Psalm 51, 5, and we know that, you know, David wrote that after his uh, transgression with Bathsheba and then going on to kill her husband. And part of his uh, Psalm 51 and verse 5 says, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. So, let's move on. So, a, gen a generational curse is the cumulative effect on a person of things that their ancestors did or believed or practiced in the past. Some common examples of generational curses include idolatry, violence, disobedience, um, certain kinds of illnesses, but all of these become patterns. They, they, they are like deposited in the bloodline. And then they uh, uh, work their way out through the generations, the first, second, third, or fourth generation. So it's, it's very dangerous to trespass the laws of God because they bring a curse. It brings a curse. It brings something harmful to the person and to the generations after them, if it's not removed. Sin and trouble passing from generation to generation is a continual theme throughout the Old Testament. Tonight, we will look at the three ways in which we may come under defilement of generational sin. We may, number one, inherit our inherit our propensities to sin through our genes. Number two, through example. Now, by living in a family, we all see different kinds of things. It's not always all good, and it's not always all bad. But generally, the example of the horrid bad things creates hurt in the heart of the one, the child, or whoever that's experiencing the, uh, the examples being, being demonstrated in the home. It may be just cursing, profanity. It may be alcohol, but it's an example that's being seen, and because the parents are doing it, the children think it's okay. And number three, uh, through the power of the law of judging, and receiving. And you know the Bible says, judge not lest ye be judged. When we judge, 
we reap the same thing where we have judged someone for. So moving on. By the authority given to us in Jesus Christ's name, we are able to break the bonds of generational sin. Through prayer, we can help families. We can help free families from their patterns of destruction. So, the definition of generational sin again, the effects and consequences of sin on subsequent generations. That could be violence, it could be generational trauma, addictions, codependencies, hoarding, poverty mindset, single parenthood, and dying young. These are all products of generational sin. So David prays again in Psalm 51, 5. Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. That is so profound because he's praying this after um, he repented to God and then he wrote the Psalm 51 and this is found in verse 5. He confesses his original corruption which was shapen in iniquity. I won't even go into um, what some theologians say about David's birth because I, I'm, I'm not I'm not sure that it's accurate. But I'll, I'll say this. Many people believe that, that David was not called when Samuel came to the house to anoint the new king. That David wasn't called because he was not He was not the son of the father of the house. Or they had different mothers or something. So when David say he was shapen in iniquity, there's something to that. There's something there. There's some kind of iniquity or something. So he said, you know, and that could have given him the propensity to move in on Bathsheba. So, uh, you know, it, 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 this, this whole thing about iniquity can compel a person to, to engage in activity that they may not really uh, be thinking about. They may know better, but they are pulled into the sin. Okay. He said, behold, I was shapen in iniquity. Let's consider it rather, oh, oh this is, this is some, something I saw in the commentary where he was dis, they were discussing David's thoughts when he said, I was shapen in iniquity and birthed in sin. It said, but let, let, he said, let me consider it rather an aggravation of sin. He said, Lord, I have not only been guilty of adultery and murder, but I have an adulterous, murderous nature. And where do we think that came from? He said, Lord, I therefore abhor, abhor myself. It is to be sadly lamented by every one of us that we brought, that we brought into the world with us a corrupt nature. Wretchedly degenerated from its primitive purity and innocence. We have from our birth the snares of sin in our bodies, the seeds of sin in our souls, and the stain of sin upon both. This is what we call original sin, or some call original sin. We, didn't, we, we were not saved, we were not birthed saved. We, we were birthed as those that needed a savior. So, um, because it is as ancient 
as our original and because it is the original of all of our actual transgressions. It is a bent, B-E-N-T, or a propensity to backslide from God. So when, you know, we, we, hear, we hear the altar call and we're expecting hordes of people to come forward and receive Jesus, something keeps the people from coming to receive Jesus. And he's saying here that it's part of that backslidden or bent or propensity to sin. Isaiah 44, 22 says, I have blotted out as a thick cloud thy transgressions and as a cloud thy sins. Return unto me, for I have redeemed you. So, three ways to reap blessings uh, through what is uh, sown, out, sown by our forefathers. So, we are going to go through this method of removing generational sins and curses. And this comes from uh, the Elijah House uh, work. Three ways we reap blessings and harm through what is sown by our forefathers. Number one, through genetic inheritance. Through our DNA, we are physically and chemically a part of our forefathers. We inherit, one, physical traits, illnesses passed through genes, such as diabetes and hemophilia. Two, death itself passed on from Adam as the consequences of sin. Next, the conflicts of the nations through history, through history. Ishmael and Isaac, seeds of the Arab and Jewish nations. And we know right now in our, na in our news, it's all about what the Jews and the Arabs are contending for. There's, a, there's been a contention from the beginning, and it's boiling over right now. So that, that's, that's like a sin that's passed down in the generations. So the first one was through genetic inheritance. The next one, number two, is through example or modeling. It is well documented that environment, the environment helps mold behavior. Anger teaches anger. Resentment teaches resentment. Next, what we see in the family is written in our hearts. And I know that I have, in my family growing up, my father, uh, well, he wasn't an alcoholic during the week, but on the weekends he drank. And when he drank, he became uh, uh, mean and controlling and bitter. And so there was a lot of contention in our home, especially on the weekends. And I can tell you, that affected me. I, I, I can barely take arguments and loudness and yelling and people, you know, yelling at each other. Um, it, it, it's bad. <laughs> really bad. So uh, that's by example and modeling. And number three, through the laws of God. Three ways we reap blessing and harm through what is sown by our forefathers. One is through genetic inheritance. Two is through example or modeling. And three, through the laws of God. The law of judging and receiving. It says, therefore you are without excuse, every man of you who passes judgment. For in that you judge another, you condemn yourself, for you who judge practice the same things. That's Romans 2, 1. The next part says, so whatever you wish that men would do to you, do so to them, for this is the law and the prophets. It states that the, in, the inverse corollary of the golden rule is, 
You will do to others what has been done to you. So these are the three ways that uh, generational sins are placed in a person's heart or in their bodies and manifest out. So through the laws of God continue, the law of sowing and reaping. It says, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, this will he also reap. That's Galatians 6, 7. So if, you, if, if, if you're thinking about gardening, if you planted corn seed, you're not going to reap watermelon. If, if you uh, sow love, you will reap love. If you sow hatred, it, hatred will come back to you. And therefore, this is the law of sowing and reaping. And it says, be not deceived. God will not be mocked. What we sow, we will reap. These laws existed before sin. When we chose not to repent, thereby not letting Jesus take our sin on the cross, we deny him access and condemn future generations to reap what we have sown. That right there is so very powerful. The law, these laws existed before sin. When we choose not to repent or ask, and ask for forgiveness, thereby not letting Jesus take our sin on the cross, which he has already paid to do so, we deny him access into our hearts to be changed. And therefore, we condemn future generations because what's in us is going to flow down to the generations. Examples of generational sin. Common patterns of famil familial trouble include Women molested by their fathers, generations of alcoholism, divorce, tragic illness and premature deaths, multiple miscarriages, closed wombs, financial and business failure, and occult involvement. And the sin of occultism is different from all the others in that this generational sin can especially be especially damaging Symptoms may include curses on the family from Deuteronomy 28, verse 15, unaccountable financial reverses, affliction through diseases which refuse diagnosis or treatment or recurring ailments, family feuds, unresolved conflicts, tendency to be drawn to the occult even without knowing it. Remember when horoscopes were so big, 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 and everybody was getting their horoscopes done? People really didn't know they were engaging in the occult, but it's an occult practice. It's not from God. Family feuds, unresolved conflicts, tendencies um, to be drawn to the occult, even without knowing it, forms of prayer, visualization, so-called Christian cults, these are all from the occult. How to bring healing from generational sin. Cherish the good parts of your inheritance. Speak good about the family. Recognition to see and name a thing is to begin to have power over it. Recognition. How to bring healing from generational sin recognition of it as sin and at see and name a thing is to begin to have power over it help trace the history these are some positive things help trace the history of the family watching for distinct recurrent patterns build a family tree use a life history form or ask Holy Spirit for understanding. Confession. We lead the persons coming to us for ministry. We lead them in confessing the truth of the situation and acknowledge their participation in it 
asking the Lord to forgive them. Repentance. We are now on how to bring healing from generational sin. Confession was just what I read. Repentance. The Bible says a righteous son will not inherit the father's iniquity. It also says no one is righteous. Thus, we must depend on the cross to stop the trouble. We are not equipped in ourselves to stop the trouble. We must depend on the Lord Jesus Christ and how he has asked us to repent and confess our sins and bring it to the cross. Also, repent for the ancestors and repent for yourself. Then the prayer um, that we are going to pray uh, in a few minutes. Uh, pray about each specific descending pattern, divorce, cancer, alcoholism, homosexuality. Reckon it as dead on the cross. So, we're moving on here. These are some results of generational sin. And it, it, it just boggles the mind how it, it's so prevalent in our society today. It, it seems like our society has just run amok and it's crashing, uh, coming to a crash and burn. But we know that God wants us saved, and people will be saved. But these are some results of generational sin. Alcoholism, addictions, drugs, food, sex, etc. Diabetes, heart problems, scoliosis, cancer, blood disorders, circulation problems, allergies, multiple, uh, uh, multiple sclerosis, dyslexia, Epilepsy, Alzheimer's disease, deafness, kidney problems, obesity, anorexia and bulimia, schizophrenia, depression, divorce, physical, sexual, emotional abuse, occult involvements, miscarriages, barrenness, poverty, violence, untimely deaths, adultery, homosexuality, bestiality, betrayal, rebellion, dying out of family lines, criticism, idolatry, crime, incest, blindness, physical and spiritual uh, blindness, and lying. So now you have your handout, right? The area that we are going to deal with is um, abandonment and rejection. I just felt like everybody probably has felt some abandonment and rejection, whether it was in your family, among your friends, or whatever the case may be, we all experience it. And even Jesus said, my, my father, my father, why have you um, abandoned me? So on the one page is the prayer, sins of the fathers and resulting curses. Now, in that first blank, you will say the bold header at the top of the list of the uh, abandonment and rejection. That abandonment and rejection goes in the first blank. You pray number two. We all going to do this together, and I chose one thing so that we all could be saying the same thing, okay? And number three, you pray through that. We get to number four, you pray through that. And number five, you begin with, I renounce the sin and curses, and you're going to say from the top to the bottom of the page, saying every word. Then number six, you pray through that. Then number seven, um, we pray through that, and we're going to receive some blessings. This is where it's so important. We're going to receive some blessings to replace these sins and curses. So you can look at the sins and curses and think, what is opposite of, of isolation? What is opposite of neglect? What is opposite of reject, rejection of God? 
acceptance or self-rejection or victimization. So in number seven, we're going to receive some blessings to replace these sins and curses. And then I'm going to uh, decree over you that these blessings have been placed into your bloodline and will flow to a thousand generations, okay? If you were having your very own personal session, you, 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 would, you would do all 18. There are 18 categories. Some people have more in some than others, but we all have stuff. We all have stuff. So if you want to stand, you may stand. If you want to sit, it's okay for you to sit. But we are all going to pray together beginning at number one. Ready? I confess the sins of my ancestors, my parents, and my own sin of abandonment and rejection. I choose to forgive and release them for the sin, the curses, and the consequences in my life. I ask you to forgive me, Lord, for this sin, for yielding to it and to the resulting curses. I receive your forgiveness. On the basis of your forgiveness, Lord, I choose to forgive myself for involvement in this sin. I renounce the sin and curses of abandonment and rejection, abdication, blocked intimacy, desertion, divorce, isolation, loneliness, neglect, separation, self-pity, rejection of God, rejection of others, expected rejection, perceived rejection, self-rejection, and victimization. Number six, I break this power from my life and the lives of my descendants through the redemptive work of Christ on the cross. I receive God's freedom from this sin and from the resulting curses. I receive acceptance. You can receive um, acceptance of God, acceptance of others, self-acceptance. You can receive, um, instead of isolation, you may receive corporateness. Instead of loneliness, you may receive uh, vibrancy with people. Okay, so now uh, what we do is um, bless what you have just done. So we said, Father, we thank you, Lord God, that these curses of abandonment and rejection have been dealt with. That they will not flow down to a thousand generations because of the cross of Jesus Christ. We set the cross between each one of the persons here, Lord God, and this sin and curse of abandonment and rejection. And Father, you said that it's the blessing of the Lord that makes rich and add no sorrow with it. So we decree over these that have received this blessing of all the blessings that they just received. We decree that they are set into their bloodline, Lord God, and that they will see fruit. They will see fruit, and these blessings will flow to a thousand generations. And Father, we thank you, Lord God, that it is your uh, goal to bless us you sent your son that we would be blessed and not cursed. And as it says in Galatians, he took the curse. We are no longer have to be under the curse. Well, we need to do our part. Father, we thank you and praise you for tonight. We bless each person who chose to come. And Lord God, we decree and declare that as we move forward, especially this area that we prayed through tonight, abandonment and rejection, will no longer be in their bloodline. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, amen and amen.